Okay, <coughs> so we can uh, spend the next 50, mi 50 minutes in uh, discussing about uh, what we mean with an ambient intelligence system. So analyzing the definition or definitions, because maybe may more than one, of uh, ambient intelligence systems, MEI for short. Uh, let's start from observing what's happening in the technology field where we have uh, many different uh, um, types of technologies that are in a way converging into a single path so we have uh, all the domain of mobile devices mobile technologies and so on which is a domain by itself uh, a lot of innovation not only devices and so on we have the world of smart devices something that you can put into your, your house and do something maybe devices standalone devices maybe appliances in your house uh, that are that are becoming smart smarter in some way these devices in some way use the existence of the mobile world because they you always can be controlled by mobile application and so on so there are some way extensions of the physical space because they give you some new properties behaviors features of your space of your home but are also extensions to mobile devices because they rely on them and they are sort of a physical extension of what's a software application and uh, and these are one it's a path that is inside the domain of consumer consumer electronics basically device electronic devices miniaturized and are designed to be sold individually to the final users with a given life cycle and we can imagine some type of brands that are behind all these uh, um, types of devices and types of solutions but there's also another uh, word that is word of the old home automation which was pre-existing was already there when you have the you know, imagine a, a big building when you have a centralized heating system you have a centralized lighting system you have centralized air processing system you see that yeah up there yeah there are very complex and intelligent systems that are controlling the quality of the air the temperature the lights uh, is not always what we would like to be but there are already these uh, uh, building automation systems okay that were in place and they were developed with, with totally different technologies by different brands different companies different architectures from what we have here so it's something that was part of the electrical plant of the building part that was designed to deal with high energies with high voltages uh, to be designed together with the building not something to be added later like here and then we have other brands so basically there are the brands that are that are building and selling automation components uh, uh, that are building and selling uh, um, uh, electrical plants components and so on so that that they were totally disjoint the difference between automation and smartness you know, are very light different but actually automation is just following a schedule and being smart something with more programmable more adaptive but with the same technologies actually these two different words are in, in a way coming together because right now we are in buildings that are that do have some automation capabilities and then we add we enrich them with other devices so with all of these internet of things hat on top of that today they develop this buzzword internet of, of things iot uh, that in, in a way covers everything so it becomes also difficult to understand which part of that you are referring to but there's uh, in a way some convergence uh, different technologies are being put together maybe work together into a system where generally things of different nature can communicate and can work together all this also thanks to connectivity to increase connectivity everything can be connected should be connected the home automation of 15 years ago was not a connected home it was an automation an automated system isolated from the rest of the world today it's not possible even to even think about having a building which is not connected 
to the external world, to the internet, and so on. And uh, the capability of cloud computers or, or, or other um, computing infrastructures. So a lot of different technologies now enable us, imagine what could be a mobile device without a cloud. If you only had computation and data storage on your device and it couldn't rely <coughs> on remote storage of information and sharing information and socializing information and so on. Hmm? So these are all very different technologies, one, three, two, three, four, that now need to work together and actually do work together for providing uh, new, uh, new applications. Okay, this was just a definition of IoT but you can appreciate how general it is okay just any object that is given connectivity is part of this so-called iot uh, what the definition doesn't say and what we are interested in saying is what for why why are you giving an ip address to this bottle of water uh, is it useful for something maybe maybe not depends on the application so the focus that you want to give is a uh, or when all of these technologies are mixing together or integrating together or evolving into something smarter and smarter what is the point of view of the user actually this example is uh, about the smart home but the smart transportation is or will be the same in, a, in, in the future the home movement the application to the home started before because just the market is wider and uh, so the smart home is something that, okay, people that were building uh, telecommunication systems are saying, well, the smart home is my domain because I'm already bringing you the internet connectivity so I can bring you, also bring you the smart home services. And people from consumer electronics say, okay, the smart home is my domain because I already built smartphones with cameras and so on so I will build new devices that will make your home smarter. And people uh, doing automation, industrial or home automation, say, okay, we already, we have 30 years experience in automating buildings. So why not uh, smart homes are our domain? And uh, I don't know, people selling appliances, dishwashers, fridge, that are in every house are saying okay but smart home is our domain because our product will be there anyway so we make them smarter and they will make the home smarter so it's not very clear whose domain it is the intelligent environment is domain could be the domain or could be a market uh, let's use this stronger word market not just domain of many different <coughs> industry segments each of them with different needs, with different uh, uh, business models, with different approaches. Just imagine the, the difference in approach between a, a service provider or a telecommunication provider, which more or less have the same approach toward the user, the customer. They want to sell you a, uh, a continuous payment system. So you enroll to Netflix every month, uh, you pay a fee. As long as you are satisfied, you will be paying your fees. So they want to keep uh, also your telecommunication provider. Hmm? It's a long-term agreement with diluted fees over the time. So the interest of, of these people that are providing a service a service is to keep the client as much as long as possible by giving them by having a continuous service providing continuous service with small improvements over time probably consumer electronics industry is totally different they they will do anything they can for selling you the device but two milliseconds after you paid you are no longer value for them it's just a cost first you were you were a prospect customer then you became a customer you paid and then you are a cost support is a cost for these people support for these people is continuation of service so 
So it's keeping the, the, the user. So total different business models. And this, you can see that in the products. Uh, some products that only work as long as you keep the, 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 um, sub, uh, the subscription going. When you close the subscription, the service is no longer working. In this case, uh, you can keep the service as long as the device is working. When the device is over, you throw it away and you lose everything. Uh, one single device can provide value. A set of devices will provide value. Because only when they are together into my own automation system, then they will work together. So, and every, you can, you can see, go to the supermarket uh, and, and have dif see different types of products uh, and you can see, see how they, the designers are thinking about their users, their business models. And the, the business models are inside the product. Okay, the only stakeholder that can say <laughs> what they want are the users. Yeah, so they are bombarded from many different directions or different offers that are incompatible to each other because they are competing industries. And the user is there and saying, okay, but is nobody, talking, uh, is nobody thinking about me, really? Hmm? Are there any solutions which are good for the user, not just good for that industry segment in general? Because the user doesn't care whether a service is provided by one or uh, sector of industry or another. The user cares whether the service is useful for him or her. That's it. Think about the computer industries. Computer industries have one big word in mind. Cost, of course, interoperability. In the computer industry, it's impossible that you can buy a computer and, and you cannot connect it with a USB key or with a printer or with, uh, with a Wi-Fi router because they are of a different brand, okay? It happened 25 years ago. But now the computer industry has learned the lesson and they can sell devices only if they interoperate 100%. Well, mobile device vendors, not so much. Appliance vendors, not at all. Because you say, you go to an appliance vendor and say, okay, you can have your smart fridge and your you know, smart oven, and they work together only if they are both of the same brand. My brand, because it's the best. Hmm? So it's a very, and you can never do that with computers, okay? Except actual, uh, actual like that or, or whatever. So many different approaches. all of the other technology level. What we, are, what we want to focus instead is on building applications, IoT application or ambient intelligence application, which are a subset of those. When I'm building an application for a user, I need to be able to integrate all of this if I need it. If I need a sensor that comes with a subscription service and another device that comes with a purchase model okay that's how the world is uh, it is i cannot change it but i want to have the devices work together in some way create an application that is able to integrate both of them why for the benefit of the users so when we move from the technology point of view how to create a device how to make the devices communicate how to integrate those devices. These are all technology view. When we move from the technology view to the user view, we are uh, bridging the gap between technology and uh, intelligence and users. So when we talk, we are we're talking about ambient intelligence or intelligent environments. We are talking more about uh, the functionality and the benefits for the user than the whole lot of technologies that are needed for reaching that goal. So that's why we want to spend the first month of this course talking about the users. Um, ambient intelligence. Oh, IoT is uh, written everywhere. A lot of people are talking about IoT this and IoT that and so on. 
ambient intelligence is not so widely uh, popular as a keyword it's not new either you see there was a publication sponsored by the european commission scenarios for ambient intelligence in 2010 we are in 2019 today okay this document was published in 2001 it's 18 years old today it can drive a car okay uh, tw of course it was published in 2001 and they started wor working it a couple of years uh, before so 20 years ago people were already thinking about ambient intelligence and if you download this this report and skim it through the pages you see that many of the things that in the year 2000 they thought that could be the future for 2010 well there we don't have them yet in 2020 they are reasonable things there were people that were doing uh, reasonable forecastings with uh, the available technologies it's not something like science fiction something it's an industry document uh, forecasting but 20 years later 20 years after the publication and 10 years after that the projected time uh, some technologies are not yet used uh, in widespread usage okay not for technical reasons basically for system reasons so there was no integration interoperability or in general um, collaboration between the different providers to provide the service but anyway if we go back to what people wrote 20 years ago they said that ambient intelligence provides a vision of the uh, information society with a greater user friendliness okay tell me that when you're pushing the button for a lift and you never know which button to press um, more efficient services support user empowerment so 20 years ago they were saying saying that technology was going towards more user support hmm? support for human interactions people are surrounded by intelligent intuitive interfaces well something happened if you compare for example the web interfaces of 20 years ago with, with today's websites really they are much more intuitive not much more intelligent probably uh, we cannot compare mobile application because 20, 20 years ago we didn't have mobile phones so uh, they cannot be compared they don't they are not thinking about mobile phones here because it was it was yet to invent that, that kind of device objects and uh, uh, interfaces embedded in objects and in the environment and the environment will be capable of, of recognizing and responding to the presence of different individuals so if different people enter into a, a room a car a house a school the environment could react differently it doesn't today I, i'm not aware of basically any application that does this in a seamless in uh, an obtrusive and often invisible way we'll come to this invisible it's important so this is something that were, they were saying 20 years ago and the, uh, this, in this book there are f I, th I think six different scenarios examples of scenarios uh, that were developed at the time and if you read them you say okay it's reasonable the technology for doing this is it's already available but we are not seeing that applied why hmm? this is an interesting question okay there are, i try to get another definition from other papers uh, of what ambient intelligence is but we don't go into the details so i just focus on this one which is the one we like best uh, for this course an mei system so i like it because uh, we have the word system here it's not a device it's not a software it's not a computer it's a system it's a digital environment of course it's not just an environment but an environment enriched with digital features that proactively but sensibly supports people in their daily lives proactively but sensibly what do these words mean proactively means that the environment will pro act act before okay so 
it's not something that where I push a button and then the light will reach home. Like this is a, is a reactive system. The user does some action, the system reacts uh, with the response. A proactive system is a system where the system will react uh, or <coughs> proact before the user requires that. Because the user understands, sorry, the system understands what the user wants. So the user doesn't need even to ask for it because we already it, the user will al already have the response before asking and at the point he will not ask anymore so it's a system that will try to anticipate the needs of the user and give a response for them proactive that's where the intelligence comes knowing the users understanding what he wants and doing that and understanding how to do that you cannot be do that in general, of course, but in a specific task, probably yes. But sensibly. And this is the, the most difficult part of, of all of it. Um, being proactive is just a matter of uh, pattern matching. If every time I go, uh, I enter a room, I switch the light on, then the system can learn that person enters a room then switch the light on except probably when that room is the bedroom it's three o'clock in the night uh, and i'm just entering the room and the light will go on and will wake everybody else that is sleeping there that's not a good response it's not a sensible response it's proactive it's doing something in advance but something wrong so uh, I tell you a tale, uh, you know the Nest thermostat, okay? The first models already have since the beginning the, the learning capability. So you, in the first days you could uh, uh, increase or decrease the temperature level by hand and then you will adjust and then the thermostat will learn your habits and then will apply this profile of temperature automatically. In the first model it was learning too hard. Meaning that usually maybe you go to bed, I don't know, at 10 o'clock in the evening. So at 10 o'clock you, you uh, reduce the, te the temperature level. So it learns that at 10 o'clock the temperature should drop. Okay, we uh, there was people, were people that invited friends at home some nights, some evenings, and uh, there were no way of uh, insisting on the nest uh, to keep the temperature high after 10 o'clock because we learned so so well that at 10 o'clock you go to bed then he couldn't understand it well yes but not tonight because i have friends at dinner so we are staying up late so doing anticipating a user action and anticipating the right the correct user action the good user action are, to, are totally different uh, uh, problems so doing something in advance but sensibly and sensibly is not just m monitoring the user but actually, actually understanding what the user has in mind or wants to do which is what well, can i say impossible so it's a matter of striking a balance if i'm too conservative on sensible sensibleness i would do nothing because i don't want to risk doing the wrong thing if I'm too proactive, I will do damages. So, what's the right balance between the two? Well, first of all, one solution is don't do, ask. Or do sensibly. When in doubt, ask. The user is there. You could ask, do you want to? Or may I? Or should I? I don't know, maybe with voice, maybe with other hints, with other behaviors. A lot of systems are trying to be too intelligent so that the user in a way is not or is monitored but is not involved in providing the services it's not a shame to involve the user okay it may help the system doing the right choice by trying to get some additional information from the user itself and okay for doing that uh, uh, that we will we'll analyze this 
picture a lot of different technical features should be built into an MEI system mm -hmm. we see them one by one well we have another definition that we sometimes use of intelligent environments if you read more or less it says the same thing the key point is that it talks about enhancing the occupants experience so people should be happier or better served when inside an intelligent environment when inside an ambient intelligence system uh, we suggest you to read this paper intelligent environment manifesto which uh, makes uh, it's, it's not a very long paper um, there should be the link on the website uh, for downloading that um, and uh, then we it will explain better the the, the the evolution and the architecture of this uh, intelligent environment so if you can read it by before the next week uh, it will be easier uh, to follow and uh, for for uh, for better understanding this point uh, i'm trying to ask i'm going to ask this question imagine an enchanted house or an enchanted castle you not know, the castle of the fairs or the princesses or the house of your dreams or whatever okay something very the top of the old technologies well, wh whatever the house can provide or a castle or a, mm, environment something you say okay that's that's paradise and then imagine the haunted house you know you know the this is the house from the it the movie it the movie which is actually an example of a house that is, is scary enough okay and uh, but not only this one or some haunted castle with witches uh, with uh, ghosts uh, with uh, traps uh. what is the difference you say oh there's a there's a whole lot of differences okay let's try to be an engineer and try to design the enchanted house and try to design the haunted house well they become more similar than you think because both are autonomous systems in performing some actions they play music the difference is that the enchanted house plays celestial music nice music relaxing music and the other one is playing uh, uh, nasty noises uh, and squeaks and cracks and uh, but they are both uh, controlling the audio the audio environment they are both controlling doors and windows the enchanted house will open the door behind uh, in front of you and close it behind and the haunted house or haunted house they always slap doors in every movie <laughs> they always slap doors the first the, the first symptom of, of the haunted house you walk in and turn the door closes behind you so but that's the same system okay it's so it's not also the enchanted house will close the door behind you what's the difference it's the same system technically something for controlling the house and closing it behind the user in one case it's enchanted and the other is scary providing food providing entertainment uh, and maybe in the second case entertainment is that you you drop uh, uh, through the to the floor uh, it's, a, it's very funny and uh, you, you break your leg and then <laughs> the other thing. so the type of basic functionalities for controlling the environment are the same understanding what is where the user is what is doing what he wants and then doing or changing something physical doors windows audio lights so to implement the first or to implement the second you the, the second you would need a similar intelligent system only the rules are a bit different and where is this difference in the rules in it's in the user perception so in the first case the actions of the enchanted house are the expected action from the user by the user the user actually really wanted that at that moment they they were they were desired they were welcomed the actions of the system by the user so the environment was friendly because it was doing 
what the user in that moment wanted. And the haunted house will execute the actions contrary to the will of the user. The user doesn't want to be locked down. It's not a matter of shutting down the door. The matter is that it will not reopen again. Hmm? So the user will feel trapped, not served by the system. Trapped inside the system. Instead by an hostile entity. And this feeling is real. If you go to a place where there is too much automation and if you feel that that automation is beyond your control, even if this place is very nice, you will feel trapped. Because you cannot control it. You, the, the system is doing something you don't understand. It's doing something you don't want in that moment. Maybe something that is done for good. The system thinks it's good things. Okay, it's programmed to think that it's good. But in that moment, it's not what you want. So you will feel the environment acting against you, even in the best intention of the, of the environment. So it, this is the, it's a very, very fine line that divides the two. If you are doing something too strong, too invasive, then you are going against the user. The user only wants a small help to make something better, and that's uh, and not taking over every aspect uh, independently of whether you are doing it well or not. Mm -hmm. Just to complete this example, you know the, well, maybe you don't, but doesn't you, you, of you know the, the TV series uh, or the movies of the Adams family? Okay, more or less. Okay. That family, they lived in a house like this with crocodiles, with creaks, uh, with um, noises, with hands uh, moving and so on. But they were happy. The house was scary by normal standard, but it was okay for them because it's what they wanted. So there's no absolute. It's fitting the behavior of the user to the needs or desires, sorry, fitting the behavior of the system to the needs or desire of the user. That's not easy. It's not easy, so there's no off-the-shelf market solution for that, but also because every house is different, every person is different, so finding a solution that fits everyone is practically a, a very big challenge. Okay, so in this scenario, they, okay, we probably we want to make an enchanted system, mobility system. What do we need from a technological technology point of view? Okay, well, we need these four. We call them steps in a circle because oh, they all interact with the inner circle: sensing, reasoning, interacting, and acting. Sensing. Sensing means that the system, the MEI system, must be able to measure some physical quantity, take some measures from the physical environment. These measures could be presence, could be temperature, could be movement, could be images, could be heartbeat, could be opening a door could be the weight of something could be the speed of something could be the distance of something you name it could be the gas composition uh, or some sample of air could be a torque could be a force you name it there are sensors for everything What are the physical quantities of the environment that the system needs to know to create the enchanted scenario? Once we know which are the physical quantities, we can design the sensor. We can select the sensor that we know that we need. Sensors that are sensors on the environment, or I put the here bracelet sensors on the user. I can measure something about this room. I can measure something about the car, about the street, about the user. Of course, I will deploy the sensor in a different place depending on what I have to measure. And the market of sensors is infinite. 
So there are sensors for everything. And many of them are, by today's standard, cheap. Some, some dollars for nearly any type of sensor. Of course, if you want something very high precision grade, you, they will be costly. But if you need just a measurement of with, with, not, with a not, not, not a very good precision, usually you can find something very cheap. And you can measure any type of physical quantity. And this measurement could be taken even transparently to the user. The user doesn't need to do any action for getting this information. These are just some, some examples of sensors that are designed for being integrated into a smartphone system. But yeah, just a very, I just mm, did a Google search and put some picture here. There is really everything. So the, the, the last of our problems is finding the sensor that we need. It's really the last, okay? Understanding what we need to sense, what we need to measure, it's a bigger problem from design point of view, okay? Wearable sensors, environmental sensors, and so on. The problem with sensors is that the, oh, the problem. Sensors are there to produce data. But what are the characteristics of sensor data? Well, especially IoT sensors or smart home sensors or wearable sensors, something which is cheap, doesn't consume a lot of power, it's not even very precise. This data is bad. It's difficult to analyze. First of all, well, it may be huge. Huge, huge quantities of data. You have a sensor that measures a quality every minute for one year. And you have maybe a hundred of these sensors. So how many and every measurement maybe is four or five physical quantities. I'm measuring temperature, humidity, uh, lightning, uh, and so on. So you have a lot of data to sift through. So it will become big. It's noisy data. <coughs> noisy because the quality of the transceiver is not very good. So maybe there will be a lot of errors, measurement errors normally, but uh, so the, you will see the value that will change without any apparent reason, without any reason, just the noise of the sensor. Noise because maybe they are measuring something out of context. You know, uh, you are measuring the quality of air in a given point, and right at the moment when you are taking the measurement, a very old truck passes by, making those very big black clouds of gas. But that measure, that that sample. Is, a, is, is not significant. It doesn't represent the quality of the air. It represents just the, that in that point, in that moment, it's, an, it's a sort of a source of noise, not coming from the sensor, but coming from the environment. That in that moment, it has a, it, uh, the, you know, it, ha it happened to have an, an, an anomalous condition, let's say. It's not strange, but it's anomalous, it's not normal. So you're measuring something out of the normal shape because the, the sensor is positioned in the right, in the wrong place, and the, and the measure is taken at the wrong time. I don't know, but in any case, you will have a lot of data samples that are off limits, too low, too high. They need to be filtered. They need to be validated. A lot of missing points. You know, every now and then the network connectivity goes down. You need time to reconnect. You're losing some samples. You may have a sensor that is broken, and so it will take three weeks or four to repair. And in those periods, you don't get the data. So when you're doing any kind of analysis, even on an average, you must take into account that in some periods you have data, in some periods you don't. So even making an average is not, a sim it is not so a simple operation. Hmm? You may have heterogeneous measures, something that is measured uh, in kilograms, something else in grams, you need to put together uncalibrated sensors so they have di different reference scales, especially if you have sensors of different types because you are you are deploying a system in the large across several years or months. So you need to 
bring everything back into a single reference frame no sensor in the world is producing a day uh, some output which is on the SI international system measurement uh, scale they always give a number from 0 to 8 bits to, to 55 or 16 bits or whatever and then it's up to you to rescale it and to interpret that data hmm. and so if you make an error a mistake here you're injecting wrong data into your system and so on so you need a lot of uh, uh, operations which are not easy not trivial and if you do that with a trivial operation you will get wrong result so you get a, a lot of care uh, to validate and handle this kind of data in general as I said, for our system, we try not to rely on big amounts of data. We try more to process more or less real-time data. So what's happening in these moments? We must be aware that this data could be wrong or missing in a moment, so our system should be able to handle that in some way. Yeah. You, sh you cannot assume that data is always available and always precise. Otherwise, the system will behave strangely and we don't know why. So it's a sort of a defensive programming that we need to pay, take into place. Okay, we get this data. We have problems in extracting good information from the data, but let's assume we manage. What do we do with this information? Well, this information tells us something about what the user is doing and how the environment is behaving. And so we can use this information to reason about whether we have to do something to trigger some actions everything is fine okay do it do i know do i need to do anything no okay but in some cases the combination of the user behavior what the information i get and let me start from 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 scratch if i have data measured by the sensor from this data is analyzed and we get some information some high level information and from this information we can infer the behavior of the user is this behavior inferred by the data computed from the measurements telling us that we that the system needs to change something in the environment or to communicate with the user in some way so there is this constant reasoning process that is constantly monitoring the user and constantly monitoring the environment and when some conditions are met it will decide to do something this condition could be complex, could be simple, depending on the application. Hmm? And this is where the, most of the software is. Some part of the software will be in interfacing with the sensors. We try to keep it minimal. And some part of the software is on deciding what to do, which is the added value of the system, basically. And when I decided what to do, I must do it. Well, OK, this is that. I must do it. So the system must have an acting part, meaning a part of the system that is able to act, do some action to the system. So while the sensing is measuring some physical quantity on the system, acting means changing some physical quantity of the system. Changing the sound, changing the light, changing the temperature, changing the airspeed, moving an object, applying a force, uh, sending a notification, sending a message, vibrating something. Closing the door is part of moving the object. There, otherwise, it's not the, 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 if the environment doesn't change, the system is useless. It doesn't really change anything. Even the enchanted house needs to do something. You say, oh, I built a house with uh, 1,000 different sensors and a very powerful computer. What does the house do? Nothing. Well, it tells me, tells me some information at the end of the month. That's not intelligent. It's a monitoring system. It's not an intelligent system. The system is intelligent in the measure in which it helps the users, so it does something for them. Okay, proactively is possible, but 
okay so we need uh, something that changes the environment in a way changes the environment uh, or changes the user so some physical quantity of the user maybe you know a notification of vibration or something that informs the user about something it's a, some, some sort of action okay and uh, well these are some examples and then the last point but just the last in this slide is the interaction with the user so these three points could be a system that will work or reason all by itself could do the right thing could do the wrong thing how can the system learn from the user how can the system be programmed by the user how can the system react because okay maybe it's proactive but in many cases it can be reactive it can uh, execute comments so it needs some way some means of interaction with the user Interaction can be through web interfaces, can be through mobile interfaces, can be through smartwatches, vo uh, voice interaction, light interaction. Oh, interaction is a two-way process. The system gives information to the user, and the user gives information to the system. So for example, light interaction is only from the system to the user. Something flashing, something changing color, something lighting a spot with uh, or another audio, one spot or a different one no? so it's information on one uh, on one direction all the others are bi-directional interfaces they can get or give information and this part uh, should complete the information the, the or basically so it influence the region of the system because right now we have some explicit information given to the user Okay, the user receives information from the environment because they change something and also explicitly from the interfaces. And the user gives information to the system explicitly through the interfaces, to the mobile app, and implicitly through his actions inside the environment. So in the mobility, press the brake pedal. It's an action done in the environment to, to brake the car, but the system can measure, can sense that action, and so can deduce that something could be done or should be done. So the difficult part is uh, thinking at the, the project that will include all the four parts. If you try, if you try to imagine leaving out one of these, well, you won't have the intelligence anymore because then the system will not be able to support the user for what he's doing. Or want to be able to provide any service so really all the four of these are needed and this is one of the first checks that we will do on your project proposals do you implement all the four steps okay um, ah, one just one final point about the user interfaces when possible if possible try to reuse the existing interfaces for example we have some door switches in the car we already have displays we already have uh, levers we have, uh, have lights uh, in the streets we already have uh, traffic lights we have uh, so uh, if you can give a new function to existing uh, interfaces uh, it's better because we don't the, the user doesn't have to learn anything new or can be confusing always at times okay so for today I will stop here